is the Worldwide Sports Radio Network. Great moments are born from great opportunity. And that's what you have here. That's what you've earned here tonight. Forget about the crowds, the size of the school, their fancy uniforms. And remember what got you here. If you put your effort and concentration into playing to your potential, to be the best that you can be, I don't care what the scoreboard says, at the end of the game, in my book, we're going to be winners. On this team, we tear ourselves and everyone else around us to pieces for that inch. We claw with our fingernails for that inch because we know when we add up all those inches, that, that, that's going to make the f***ing difference between winning and losing. It's down to the wire with, with, with Errol Marks and Speedy Petey. Oh, Petey! Oh, Petey! On the Worldwide Sports Radio Network. And we are back, ladies and gentlemen. This is Down to the Wire. I'm your host, Errol Marks. And my co-host, Mr. Speedy Petey. Remember, you can reach us by going to our website at www.worldwidesportsradio.com. And if you guys don't have our app, well, guys, download our app. All you have to do is go on the iOS store, which is the Apple store, and you go to WWSRN. If you don't have the app, download it. Or you go to Android and you go to Worldwide Sports Radio Network. Yes, on the Android, in the Play Store, Worldwide Sports Radio Network. We have a great show lined up today. We have, uh, we're going to be talking to FDU Knights head coach Rob T. Tomota. So we're going to talk to him very, very soon in probably about 10 minutes. Mm-hmm. And a little bit later at seven o'clock, we're going to be talking to Richmond Spiders baseball head coach Tracy Woodson. So that's going to, we're going to talk a lot about at the MLB. Tracy actually played for the last World Series champion Dodgers in 1988. So we're going to talk to him about his his role over there with the Dodgers in their championship year. And we're going to talk about really what they're going to do with their teams moving forward and, and where they see themselves as baseball managers in the future. If, if in the major, major leagues or staying in the minors or going, in, you know, coaching Bob. Rising up in college ranks. Yeah, college yeah. rankings. So we're going to get into a lot with these two head coaches very, very soon. But before we do that, I want to give a shout-out to all the fans out there, uh, all the people that are going through this COVID-19 pandemic, uh, everybody that's been dealing with it. We want to give a shout-out to all of you guys that have put in the time and, and trying to help out right now in the world because there's so much going on and so many problems going on in the world. Nobody even talks about some of the little things that are going on, but COVID is a big thing that's going on in the world. So I want to give a shout out to all the fans out there that are dealing with it. And I I do want to get into this particular story before we get into uh, talking to Rob. I Jerry Sloan, who's one of the greatest in my eyes, head coaches of my era. And I'm talking about the great Utah Jazz teams. I'm talking about the teams that played those Chicago Bulls in the 90s. The Carl Malones, the John Stocktons, even Jason Williams. And, 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 and what we've seen with all the different... And I'm, I'm sorry, not Jason Williams. Um, uh, Byron. No, no. The Will, uh, Williams that went to the Nets. I forget. Yeah, uh, it is Jason Williams. Jason, uh, I'm sorry. Jason Williams. Uh, just all the, all the different players that he has coached over the years. The Rod... Uh, Rod um, I'm sorry, not John Ron. Stockton. No, no, I said John Stockton. Carl Rudy Malone. Gobert. I'm sorry, Rudy Gobert, and, and 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 all the young players that have gone through the the teams right now, the team of the Utah Jazz. But what makes Jerry Sloan so great wasn't the fact that he played against those great Chicago Bulls teams. It wasn't Jerry Sloan's career as a head coach is a remarkable, remarkable career, and I know a lot of people. Say a lot of young players, young people don't know who Jerry Sloan was, and I. What makes Jerry Sloan so special? And and John Stockton said it best. Jerry Sloan was a guy. He was a players' coach. He really was, and this is a guy that's won a significant amount of basketball games in the NBA. He was also he also played for the Bulls. In the old, in the old days, six to seventy six, he played for the Bulls with a shooting guard. Mm-hmm. Not a bad player, fourteen points a game, average for his. Career. Well, we're not even talking about the player and 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 the player of of his stature. It's the coach and who he was as a head coach, two time NBA All Star, and we're going to go through what his career was for the NBA. Four time NBA All Defensive First Team. This was this was a great defensive player. Two time NBA All Defensive Second Team. 
Number four retired with the Chicago Bulls. So you talk about all the players that were tired with the Chicago Bulls. One of them was Jerry Sloan, a guy that averaged 10,571 points in his career in the NBA, 5,615 rebounds, and 1,925 assists. And he was a great guy. He was a great defensive player, led the league in steals a couple of years. I mean, this guy's career was remarkable. And even as, and I'm not even talking about as a player, as a head coach, this guy's remarkable career. How many wins did he have? Jerry Sloan have he had at a head coach? 1,221 wins and 803 losses. Win shout out to Kenny six. for saying th- uh, hello to us. So shout out to Kenny Rayner. Win percentage of 603 for his career. And I don't care about his win percentage. What, what you're hearing right now is Jerry Sloan had over 1,000 wins as a head coach. How many coaches in NBA history had 1,000 wins as an NBA head He's coach? He's fourth all-time. He's fourth all-time. He's one of the greatest head coaches to ever coach in the NBA. And I, I know a lot of people knew he was sick. Parkinson is not a disease that is, is, is something that you can hide. One of the reasons why Jerry Sloan retired as an NBA head coach was because of Parkinson's. And we know about Michael J. Fox and all the the big names that have had this disease and are still alive. Jerry Sloan, who I think died at the age, how old was he? He was 78. 78. This is a guy that had a long-lasting career, not even as an NBA player, but as an NBA head coach. And I know a lot of people knew he was sick for all these years. And this, this is a guy that not only was ha- highly touted as, as a player, but a great, great talent evaluator. Mm-hmm. He understood talent and what the NBA needed in the game where you needed a point guard and you needed a power forward or a center that can dominate the middle. Carl Malone was one of the greatest power forwards of all time. He's the second highest scorer in NBA history. And John Stockton, who's one of the most underrated point guards that nobody even talks about it. Nobody even tries to put him in the, the whole storyline of who the top point guards of all time is. Some people put Isaiah Thomas. Some people put Steph Curry. Some people put Jason Kidd or even Allen Iverson Magic Johnson. or Magic Johnson. Nobody puts John Stockton there. Meanwhile, John, John Stockton, Stockton leads the league all time in assists and steals. <laughs> John Stockton is one of the greatest point guards to ever play the game of basketball. Which is never even touted. Some of, some of these young analysts or broadcasters really don't know who this kid is or this guy was as a player. But Jerry Sloan, who was very well respected around the NBA and, and really throughout professional sports. And Michael Jordan had said it best. One of the hardest teams he's ever played against in his, in his career of basketball was... The Utah Jazz. Yeah, absolutely. And the, and the back-to-back years, yes, they beat the Utah Jazz, but they went through highly profiled games in those uh, Western, uh, I mean, I'm NBA sorry, finals, NBA yeah. Final Championships. Mm-hmm. I think the Jazz won the first two games both those times, one of which was in Chicago, too. So they definitely gave them a tough test. And 64 and 18, 62 and 20 were those two teams, or those two years for the Jazz in the regular season. Again, it's a small market team. It's not like Chicago that you, you could bring in these players. They had to really home grow a lot of those guys with Stockton and Malone. And Jerry Sloan did an excellent job with that. And obviously... He did that with even after that, too. His records weren't as good, but they were still a consistent playoff team for the most part. And uh, again, like you were saying, one of only nine coaches to finish without over a thousand. It's it's a really remarkable career as a basketball player who is only one of probably 10 or 11 numbers that has ever been retired with the Chicago Bulls. Mm -hmm. And then you talk about what he did as a head coach, which is one of the greatest, really one of the biggest accomplishments any NBA coach has ever had. No doubt about that. I, he probably, I think, yeah, he's definitely the winningest coach. Or no, he's the second winningest coach that has not won a title. Oddly enough, Don Nelson, who leads the league and uh, wins, did not win a title either. So he's second in that, and he's fourth all time. And I want to give a shout out to Patrick Ewing. Patrick Ewing right now mm-hmm. is in the hospital with uh, the coronavirus. He's very, very sick. And and Patrick Ewing, who has had a lot of medical problems over the last couple of years, and and I I don't know. The behind every single thing that he has or he's had over the last couple of years, but he's had a, a significant amount of problems, medical problems. Uh, this is a big story because he's still in the hospital and he's still 
in the ICU. So the, as the story grows and as it keeps pushing, you know, pushing forward, uh, we will relay all the information that we can on Patrick Ewing and, and what he's going through right now. But uh, shout out to Patrick Ewing, who right now is in the hospital with the coronavirus, uh, a guy that I've, I've, I've grown to respect. I, I grew up a New York Knicks fan, as everybody knows, and, and the great years of the New York Knicks, the 90s New York Knicks, and you can say whatever you want, and Michael Jordan can say whatever he wants about those New York Knicks teams. One of the main reasons why those New York Knicks teams were great was because of the great Patrick Ewing. So Patrick Ewing was a big part. He was the captain of the team. He led those teams uh, to those, those two championship runs that they did have, and really throughout the 90s, the 90 years, the middle of the 90s, especially when they were the most dominant with the Pat, Pat Riley time and, and the Jeff Van Gundy, the beginning of Jeff Van Gundy's career. Patrick Ewing was a big part of all those teams. But it, it's a sad story right now with Jerry Sloan, who when I found out he passed away, I think it was Friday. Mm-hmm. I was upset because I grew – he was one of the guys when, when I knew that Jerry Sloan was out with the Utah Jazz. I didn't know that he had Parkinson. That was the main reason why. Yeah. He uh, he lost he lost his job and he left the job right. and he, he obviously retired. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I I I didn't know the whole story behind it until I he was one of the guys I wanted to take over for the New York Knicks. Yeah, not they, Jeff, not Jeff Hornacek. Right, and I think uh, Mike Mike Woodson was the interim at that time, and I think the season after that, I think he wanted to coach again, but again, he just had all those medical issues. Oh, and Anthony Carricker, shout out to Anthony Carricker. Ewing came out of the hospital. One hour ago, so uh, that's that's interesting. But uh, hopefully, Patrick gets uh, healthy. This is a guy, like I said, had a lot of medical problems, and uh, he's the the head coach of the Georgetown uh, basketball uh, college basketball team. So uh, a guy that needs to start recruiting. I mean, recruit session is advised for Patrick Ewan, especially with a team that has really not gone far in those tournaments in many, many years. No, I I don't think they've made it since 2015. They were a four seed. They lost, I think, Utah in that tournament. And now they just lost one of their best players, probably their best player to transfer. (laughs) It's it's absolutely crazy. So shout-out to Patrick Ewing, and hopefully Patrick Ewing gets healthy. He's now out of the hospital. Thank you, Anthony. And shout-out to Jerry Sloan's family, a a guy that – is not only well respected in the NBA and the culture of what the NBA is today, but the culture of head coaching. And you could ask Coach K, Coach Williams, anybody in coaching who Jerry Sloan is and how well is he respected, not only with the players, but some of the coaches, the highly profile coaches in college basketball. Jerry Sloan's name is definitely one of those guys you have to look up to. So shout out to Jerry Sloan and his his family, uh, a, a very well respectable head coach in the NBA and has been in the NBA for many, many years. May he rest in peace. When we come back, ladies and gentlemen, we'll have FDU Knights baseball head coach Rob D. Tomo. To, to, to Tomo. Totoma. Totoma. I'm sorry. D. Tomo. Oh, Totoma. D. Tomo. It's Toma. D. Toma. There you, there you go. go. All right. Speedy. You know, when, when we do have these guys on the show, you have to sound them out because, again, I'm reading off a sheet over here. So, D. Toma, we there will have. <laughs> Rob D. Toma. <laughs> I'll figure it out. <laughs> when we come back, we'll have the FDU Knights head coach here on the Worldwide Sports Radio Network. It's the Worldwide Sports Radio Network. You're, 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 you're listening, listening to, to Down, Down to, to the, the Wire, Wire on the Worldwide Sports Radio Network. Six three one nine six five four nine nine zero. This is Down to the Wire. We are live every single Monday. Through Tuesday from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. New York Eastern Time. Ah, uh, man. Happy Memorial Day. It's been a long, long day. I'll tell you this right now. Holidays just get me eerie. And I'll tell you why. Not only because of this pandemic, I'm stuck in my house. And besides going to the studio and really putting the time in for doing the show, it's, it's really just, it upsets me. It really does. The world upsets me right now here on Long Island, New York. But anyways, I don't think anybody gives a crap about what I think. Anyways, as you guys know, this is Down to the Wire. We are live. Remember, you can call us and go to our website at 
www.worldwidesportsradio.com. And go on our app, guys. If you don't have our app, go on Android, go on iOS, on iOS, WWSRN, on Android, Worldwide Sports Radio Network. We have our first guest of the day, and I know a lot of people don't know who this is, but I, I was very interested, and in when I got a shout-out from Ricky saying that we're going to have this guy on the show, Ricky and Jillian, shout-out to our social media guys that really get us kicking and really what we do best on our interviews. Uh, this guy, they really wanted me to interview this guy, and I was very intrigued when I read a little bit about this guy. We are now talking to FDU Knights head coach Rob D. Toma. So what's going on, Rob? How are you? Hey, happy Memorial Day. Thanks for having me on, guys. Absolutely. It's been an uh, interesting, interesting day, especially, really, I know a lot of people are having these uh, barbecues and uh, the social distancing. They have their DJs on these floats or whatever the heck they have mm-hmm. here on Long Island. It's, it gets a little annoying when you can't really hang out with you and your, you know, your own family. Yeah, it's tough. It's different, but, you know, it is what it is, so we got to try and make the best of it. Positive. As you know, there's no sports going on, and I'm sure you had the opportunity to watch the uh, the, uh, the last, the last dance, dance with the Chicago Bulls. Did you watch that? Oh, absolutely. I like clock work every Sunday night, two hours. Uh, it reminded me like the old days of when the Sopranos were on. You, you knew the whole world was watching together on Sunday night. It was, And I grew up a... Uh, Michael Jordan fan, even though I grew up in New York. So uh, it was awesome to relive some of those days and learn some new things I didn't know from when I was a little younger. So you love the fact that Michael Jordan practically shot down the New York Knicks and the Patrick Ewan era? Every year. Loved it. I was hated <laughs> by most of my friends. But, you know, I think you're around the same age. So you grew up with all that. Uh, both Knicks, every, everything was a war, you know? <laughs> it was, they were just classic basketball games, but it was fun there. I remember those days being, you know, those Sundays in May would be like an NFL Sunday is now with how many people seem like they're watching. Were you a Nick fan or a Chicago Bulls fan? Bulls, yeah. Bulls. Really? Really? So he yeah. loved this. A rare breed. Oh, man. <laughs> Bulls Come fan on. in New York. Rob, what's going on, man? I, I mean, you live in New York and you're rooting on Michael Jordan, the enemy? Come on, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I guess it's the... Uh, Everyone, you know, they would say front runner and this and that, but it was really hard not to be a kid and be uh, into Michael Jordan, I'd say, around that age, you know. As you guys know, we are talking to FDU Knights head coach Rob D- D- Tomola. So, um, D Tomola. Tomo. I got it. I got it. You don't need to correct me. I got it. D Tomola. D Toma. <laughs> Anyways, uh, Rob, tell us a little bit about your career right now in FDU and, and what FDU moving forward, what, what is the team, uh, where do you see this team going in the near future with, with your recruiting and the scouting over there at your school? Uh, absolutely. I mean, this is uh, last June, is, or officially last July is when I got hired as the new head coach at Fairleigh Dickinson. And, uh, it was an interesting time, you know, there was a lot of players in the transfer portal, which I'm sure you're hearing more and more about now. So when I took over, the roster was obviously depleted. A lot of people were leaving. So it was definitely what you'd call a, a rebuilding situation. Um, and then we, you know, we hit the ground running. I hired a pretty exciting staff. I'm, I'm really happy with Steve Atkins and Ethan Newton, my assistants. And we hit the ground running recruiting and, all those guys that we recruited from last year to this year will be here in the upcoming fall, um, which we're really excited about. It's a, it's a large class, uh, future is bright. But I was actually pleasantly surprised with, you know, everyone's telling you rebuilding can take some time. I was really surprised. I would not say surprised, but the work ethic and the talent that was already in place here, uh, it was. It, it made me think we had a, a chance this season, and unfortunately. Uh, the season getting cut short after 13 games, uh, you yeah, know, we didn't really get to pick out the way it was going. We missed out on a lot of development of these guys. But, but the future is bright. We're really excited about what we're trying to build here. I think uh, we're on the right path. One of those players that stood out in those 13 games was Tom Rushidi, who was a third baseman and outfielder. He had 364, five home runs, 11 RBIs. What stood out t- about him most to you? Tom, Tom is absolutely... Uh, I'd say the word that comes to mind I mean, with Tom is just yeah, his professional. His professionalism. He's only a sophomore in college this year, but 
and separates himself from other college athletes. Essentially, he carries himself like other players I have coached that have gone on to be drafted and play pro ball. It just it's a business, you know, to show up, they get their job done, but they're also team guys. And he's a power. He's definitely an outfielder. We put him at third base a little this year at necessity, and shows you what kind of team guy he is. So he had to play there pretty much since he was a little. Did a little league, but he was willing to do whatever was best for the team. But he's a power hitting lefty. I mean, opening day he hit three home runs on opening day, which was <laughs> exciting. And a, as a first first year head coach, that made day one a lot easier when you see those three balls thrown over the fence. But uh, all in all, he's an offensive analyst. Top five, top six in a lot of offensive analytical categories this year. And we are really excited about Tom. Do you preach defense or do you preach offense? I know the league has changed. Major leagues, the MLB, has changed for baseball. A lot of people want to see power. They want to see home runs. I know college, and I watch the College World Series. I, I don't really watch the college season because a lot of people don't until the College World Series comes right. around and they watch the tournament. What do you preach? Do you preach? Do you preach pitching? Do you, are you looking, when you're recruiting, are you looking for some top pitchers? Are you trying to look for great defensive players in the field that have a great offensive ability? Well, absolutely. I mean, the old adage in baseball, pitching and defense with games, and it's absolutely true. It's just uh, on the recruiting circuit, the top-notch pitching, obviously, is at a premium. It's going to go to probably your bigger power conferences. So pitching um, – there's a bit of a development at our mid-major type level of Division One, so absolutely, if I had my pick, we'd have power arms and we'd roll right through and <laughs> easier to hold the team down. So <laughs> we're never going to not build through that. We're always going to be on the lookout for that. But I kind of, as a long-time assistant, I, I guess you could say I made a name for myself being, uh, obviously, I was on the offensive side of things. I was a MTO hitting coach, but when I started to get a little recognition was as a base running Guy, we led the country when I was the assistant at Fordham back to back years. We led all of Division One in stolen bases. Uh, so it's something we try and do. We try and get athletic. We try and run and create a little havoc on offense. You can combine that with the pitching, uh, which was a nice formula at Fordham University where we won when I was the assistant. Uh, I think those two things combine. When you got pitching and you can steal some runs here and there, it's a good combo. When you were at Fordham, there were two guys that just got drafted into major leagues, one of which we just had on air a couple of weeks ago in Kyle Martin. Uh, those guys drafted into baseball. What did you like most about their style of play and as people when you were coaching there? Uh, Kyle is an unbelievable talent in the sense of uh, just raw athleticism in the arm. I mean, he was, he threw from an awkward kind of three quarter ish, low side quarter uh, sidearm angle and, the best part of Kyle was this mentality he had that he was just a lot of the ball. He was our back end guy, you know, closer, I guess, in more typical terms of baseball, but a little different in college because sometimes you bring that guy in in the sixth and you let him ride. But for the main, he was that guy who could just get you that three to six outs whenever you needed it to hang on to a lead and you felt comfortable with it. I mean, in the Atlantic 10 championship game, he came in in the seventh inning. We were trying to get the last nine outs and, we're one out away from the championship, and we still make fun of him. He gave up the home run to tie the game, and then he pitched all the way till the 12th. We were able to, to win in the 12th, which is obviously not typical here. Closer, but you know, you don't hold anything back on the championship. But that's, it, it speaks to what Kyle was. He, like most of the guys that have been fortunate enough to get drafted and climb, it's an number, like I said about Tom, it's just the professionalism that you ask them to do something and you never have to worry if they're going to do it. You didn't even have to be there. They have such a plan, a regimented work ethic that they're able to attack each day, whether a coach is there or not. And a lot of times you're just going to need to say you're alone for the ride. You get to, you give them advice, pointers, but it's unbelievable what those kids were able to accomplish, especially Kyle. We are talking to FDU Knights head coach Rob Ditoma. There you go. Round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Tell him what he want, Bob. Absolutely nothing. One of our fans is actually on our feed, and he wants me to let you know that down in Florida, graduating right now, uh, they have two solid lefties right now, sophomores, that are going to be graduating next year. I'm sorry, next year. So if you want to go scouting, I could get you all that information. He says they're good lefties right now in their school. So, 
Yeah, to get you know all the help we can get nationally, East Coast, West Coast, anybody you know, we're always out there looking. Oh, so you guys know if it, I mean, he'll give you all his information after this interview. If you want to reach out to Rob, Rob would absolutely love to hear about these pitchers. But um, as a as a baseball player of my own, and I I was a baseball player growing up as a center fielder. I uh, what I learned as a leadoff hitter was bunt the ball, try to get on base, and use your legs to steal you know steal bases and and try to get into scoring position so you give the person in the batter's box an opportunity to get an RBI. Now, do you preach that or do you preach a different style of ball? Uh, you know, especially with the league has transitioning with power, like I was saying. Do you preach that or do you preach the American League ball with power? I would have definitely recruited you. Uh, I, <laughs> I, mean, I think it's a little bit of my background because I was the same thing. I mean, I, I played second base and I let off on, I'd say, 90% of the games I ever played in my life. Um, and I was always that kind of player. I wouldn't say we're, like, stressing the fact that you have to bunt and you have to run. I think what we're trying to stress is uh, let's take advantage of whatever the other team gives us. So if that's their as you probably were aware of, uh, from the type of player you're sounding like, if the third baseman was a little behind that bag, you want, I want the type of guy that will take advantage of that and try and drop the butt down. But I say if, if you can steal second after hitting a single, to me, that, that's the same as hitting a double. So however we get there is however we get there. But, uh, that's the kind of, the, in my opinion, the seed and that type of player who's always looking to take advantage of whatever is there for him. That travels, that doesn't really slump. Uh, power hitting, and yeah, it's great. If everyone hit it over the fence with doubles, triples, it makes the coach's life a lot easier. But as we've all seen, uh, especially as the games get bigger and the pitching gets better, that kind of hits the wall, and you got to figure out a way to score runs. Uh, not too many teams at any level have just slugged their way to a championship. Especially nowadays, I feel like pitching is so far ahead of the hitting at all levels. As you can watch the major leagues. A lot of strikeouts and a lot of power arms, so you got to find that way to score. Rob, are you surprised that bunting is a dying breed now in the major leagues? Not so much just because if you know kind of how the economics of baseball works and with all the sabermetric stuff, I mean, the, the game we play in college is much different. Like we're, we're willing to the risk of giving up an out to create a run where in the major leagues, they don't want to give up an out because, you know, the way the game is now, it's power arms, power back. Any guy can really hit the three-run homer at any given time, so... Sometimes it doesn't make a lot of logical sense to give up and out, you know, just to move a guy along when you're assuming maybe seven out of nine guys in the lineup to hit the ball over the fence at any given time. Uh, but I do think it, it all it runs in cycles. I do think we'll get back sooner or later to end what the game used to be. But I do understand that you, know, you, you make your money in the major leagues by putting up RBI and home runs. It's such a business now that um, you're not coaching the – one run at a time, kind of small ball mentality at that level. In addition to what you just mentioned, are there any other significant differences between college baseball and even pro baseball, either at the major league level or the minor league level? And also as a coach of a non-Power 5 conference, are there any, when you're playing a Power 5 school or a big school, what strategies and concepts do you use maybe to try to do different things when you don't have as much talent as the other teams? Yeah, that's, I mean, between college and pro, I'd say, it's a way different game, and that, and exactly what we're talking about. Like if you watch the, I think I think it's, a, it's actually at times it's a lot more exciting because there's a lot more action happening. It's not a million strikeouts, and yeah, there's probably less home runs, but there's so much more that's going on. You'll see. I think that's so a base, a very exciting play in a baseball game. I think a suicide squeeze is exciting. I think a safety squeeze, and you'll see a lot of that um, in the college game at all levels of the college game. I think. Um, if it's, you know, if you can get out of the cold and be in some warm weather, you watch an exciting brand of baseball. And, and the biggest difference is just the, the energy. If you come to a conference weekend or you're lucky enough to be in the conference tournament in some of these one big leagues, um, the energy and the craziness that's coming out of the dugouts versus a major league game where <laughs> there's not too much um, of that. And, you know, but if you watch, it gets really close when you watch like game seven of the world or any major league baseball playoff game. So now you start seeing the intensity and the importance of every 90 feet and all of a sudden guys do bun that they know how to run the bases. Um, for us, it's definitely a, our season is a sprint as far as 
24 to 27 conference games that decide who gets in the playoff by uh, that year's tournament, which is usually a double elimination for six teams. So you're, you're intense while at the major league level, it's, a, it's more of a marathon. Uh, you can't play at that same level of intensity for six months. Um, so those are mainly the differences. And when you play a Power 5 school like us, really your only chance in those games, they're, they're going to be deeper. They're, you're not like, let's, let's get to their bullpen and we'll be able to hit because here comes the next guy that throws 93 to 95. So it's more you better have the pitching to, to line up and keep you in one or two of those three games in that series. Uh, we played Kansas State this year, and we just didn't have uh, the depth of pitching to hang in there. You know, we'd hang in for four or five innings, and then we couldn't, we couldn't stay in it. And it was a little bit over our heads talent-wise. But past teams I've coached, we've had the pitching, and we've, we've hung in there. You know, we've played LSU, we've played Southern Cal, and they've been baseball games. So that's mainly the difference, though, is the depth. That, you know, there's nobody, you're not pitching around somebody to get to anybody else. These are all the top guys of the top high schools of the top recruiting circuit. There's no easy out. <laughs> we are talking to FDU Knights head coach Rob DeToma. <laughs> You got it. I'm, I'm, I'm getting good at this. I'm getting good at it. So maybe I'll be your apprentice over there. <laughs> uh, how do you pronounce his name now? <laughs> Anyways, uh, what did what were your thoughts with the Houston Astros? I mean, this whole, I guess you can say... Electronic science stealing. I, I would say about cheating, and a lot of people call it cheating, but this has been going on for a long, long time in baseball. What were your thoughts of Rob Manford not really dropping the hammer on the team, really protecting the players from this, and, and, and because they made a deal with the players on coming out with this whole story and really embarrassing the major leagues and their fan base over there in Houston. What were your thoughts to that whole situation? Well, it seems to me the only way they were going to get any information out of any of the people is to give them the immunity and <laughs> players kind of knew what was going on. And if you're going to punish them after they tell you, you probably weren't going to get any information. So it's hard to fault Manfred if he's looking for the information, but Listen, I mean, stealing signs and, and trying to exploit teams' vulnerabilities and weaknesses is, I mean, they said they shot her around the world with, <laughs> back in the day with uh, people knew what pitch was coming. So, I mean, it's been going on forever. Uh, and it's kind of that unwritten rule of baseball. If you don't want your signs stolen, do a better job of disguising them. But there was no technology. <laughs> I don't think there was this much of a wearing a buzzer, which I guess hasn't been proven, but hard to dispute running down the line with holding your jersey. I mean, I just don't think that has a place in the game. I think that's a little taking it to the extreme. But hey, when you're when it's big business and there's that much at stake, I don't know what the light doesn't have someone trying to be one step past the system, you know, ahead of the system. So but to me, I, I mean, growing up a Yankee fan, I, I I loved Joe Girardi when he was a manager. It's a little annoying to you know, they lost game seven in his last year there and that was the year that they're being told that every new every pitch was coming. So it, it's frustrating, but um, I don't think there's a place in the game for wearing electronic devices, <laughs> and that's your way of getting information to your hitters. Are you surprised that that hasn't happened in college baseball, at least not yet, that it's been caught with all the scandals that normally go on in college sports? Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's hard. I, you'd have to have such a... I mean, it goes on in the sense of, like, you try and know the team sign sequences, you try – I mean, to me, there's nothing illegal about a, a runner on second base trying to pick up the sequence from the catcher. I mean, that's like a normal event in college baseball. So <laughs> you're always changing up your signs. Uh, and now that as we get more technology in college, there's – every game's being streamed, every game's on TV, so there's cameras in center field. So even game to game as a coach, you have a lot more work to do. You can't have the same sign sequence for the following weekend as you did before with a man on second. Uh, maybe it's gone on. I've never been in a situation where I thought another team was cheating beyond the normal realm of on the field, looking at coaches, um, trying to pick up their signs. Rob, uh, I know baseball over there in college is completely different from the majors and over there in college, they play with aluminum bats and in the major leagues, they play with, uh, 
fiberglass and all different styles of bats, wood. Do you think that the college game should transition into the style of baseball bats that they use in the major leagues so the players are more used to playing that way when they go to the major leagues? I don't know. I mean, every when they go to summer leagues like in Cape Cod or New England or a lot of these leagues around the country, every single summer ball league is wood. Um, I wouldn't mind if the, the college game went to wood, but uh, and I don't really, I mean, there's a lot of, contractual agreement with the back company. It's been a lot of these big programs, which is a lot of the reason uh, it stays. But I think it's kind of, it has some uniqueness to it. It differentiates the game a little. Uh, you know, a good a good hitter doesn't need the medal, but I think it keeps a lot of other people in the game, per se, if, if that makes sense. Like, you're, you're able to keep at an even level. So, so, again, like right now, the offensive numbers are so low behind where our pitching level is in college baseball. I mean, you have pro level ready pitching talent and you definitely don't have nine hitters in every lineup that can turn around their fastball. So I think the game's more on the pitching side right now. So if we went to wood now, I think you might get even lower scores and best offense. So I don't think we need it right now, but I definitely wouldn't be opposed. I mean, I love that the player, the summer leagues with the wood and it's uh Definitely a better sound in the cages, especially indoors when you're in the, in the, <laughs> in the gym or doing any of that. But um, I like the metal. I mean, it's just something we've become so accustomed to. I've never really thought too deep about it. Last question for me. We've seen this a lot since the pandemic has really hit in a lot of college sports, this instant transfer policy. We, I've asked a lot of different college analysts about it. This Again, you don't have to take a year off anymore with the transfer. You pretty, it's pretty much like a free agency kind of thing. What are your thoughts to the way that the NCAA has done it, and how much do you think it will impact baseball? So, I mean, in our sport, it's still in Division One. You have to sit out a year if you're going to transfer, and it's, it's up for vote. It got tabled again until January. So at least for one more year, it's not kind of the free – Rain of transferring. There is ways around it if you were a non-scholarship, non-baseball scholarship player. If you were granted a waiver, um, you might not have to sit out a year, which opens up a lot more problems. But um, as of now, you still have to sit out. But it's coming. We're all aware that it's going to happen where your players transfer, which is going to make things tough. I, you know, I'm all for the, the free market and that kind of thing, but it will, I think, have a a little bit of a negative effect on especially the mid-major school because, you know, we do we work really hard to get maybe the under-the-radar player or the, the pitcher like we talked about that needs to be developed a little bit. And you work really hard, you recruit those players, you commit to each other, and maybe as a freshman he's still in that development mode and your plans for him are sophomore, junior year, he's going to make an impact in your program. But Nobody, you know, if you're sitting for a year and people are putting it in your ear as a freshman that if you transfer, you're going to pitch, you, it, it opens up that kind of door, if you know what I mean. And it, it's hard. It, it really, we depend on development of our players. So, um, some of these bigger programs, they just depend on bringing in a, a new flock of guys when the people aren't developing. So, it could hurt us. But it also could open up the door to, you know, a lower level than us being transferred. And so, uh, there's always those kind of circumstances that could go either way. I, I'm not in favor of it, uh, but it's hard to tell a kid when a coach can leave and go through a better situation. It's hard to tell a kid that they shouldn't have the same rights, I guess. Rob, last question for me. Were you upset or do you agree with the NCAA cancellation because of this pandemic? Do I agree if they should have canceled the season? Yes, yes. Yeah, I mean, at the time, obviously, we were like, this is a little crazy, a little premature. Um, but who knew? You know, I mean, it's still going on. I haven't really been able to leave my place in three months. So, I mean, <laughs> obviously, I think they made the right call. Um, and I think, obviously, once still there that night, and they, once they stopped the NBA season, I knew we were in trouble. <laughs> I knew we weren't going to um, that much. I, I wish it was more of a holding pattern, but it was so many – moving parts to that because you have people from all over the country on your campus and how do you get them home and how do you bring them back and um so i as time grew i really started to understand and now we're all just you know we're turning the page to next year and trying to figure out the best way 
as I'm sure you guys follow. Of just course. To, to get kids back on campus and get started again, that's my biggest concern now. Uh, but do I, I, I think everyone made the right call when it was time to shut down just because we didn't, it seemed like so many people were caught off guard here and we didn't know what, what was happening nationally. But I, I was obviously the safest and smartest move at the time. Rob, why don't you tell the fans how they can reach you on social media if you have anybody that you know, all the fans out there that you know that Rob could go out there to Florida or California, Sacramento, wherever you guys are, if you want to reach out to Rob and, and get them some of the athletes or some of the players that you'd be interested or he'd be interested in possibly going to scout, reach out to him. How, how could they reach out to you? Well, I'm on Twitter. It's uh, R-D-I-T-O-M-A. 19, the number 19, so at our Datoma 19, and obviously uh, FDU Night Space has a Twitter handle. We have our athletics website uh, where my email address is, which is just our Datoma at FDU.edu. I mean, it's not hard. If you want to find us, you'll find me. And I try and get back to everybody as, as much as I can, but uh, you know, and, uh, it's an interesting time, especially in recruiting, so Never feel like a uh, question is going to bother anybody. We're, we're here to help and I'd love to hear from anyone who's interested in our program, that's for sure. Rob, thank you for joining us. We'd love to get you on again when the season does start again next year or this coming year. If there's a baseball season, we'd love to get you on and talk about FDU and, and, and where they're heading uh, as far as I'm concerned in uh, baseball. Yeah, anytime you guys call me on, I'd love to talk about our program. I think the future's bright. Oh, and we, we've been reading a lot about you guys, so we're, ex- we're very excited. We actually talked to uh, Mr. Martin's la- last week. It was last week? Kyle Martin was two weeks ago, yeah. Uh, two weeks ago, mm-hmm. and we talked to him, and he spoke nothing but high praise of you and your program. So uh, uh, one of our uh, social media people actually reached out to us and said, let's reach out to his coach and interview his coach. So uh, you gave us some great insight of what's going on in the college rankings and what you thought about the whole Astros situation. So we really appreciate you joining us. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Hopefully, uh, good luck with the show. Good luck with Coach Woodson. He's a great guy. Oh, we're definitely we're looking forward to uh, interviewing him very, very soon. I think it's 7 o'clock, right? Yep. So we'll have Coach Woodson on, and we'd love to hear his intake of 1988 with his uh, Dodger years and, and winning that World Series and where he sees his spiders going in the near future. So, thanks, Rob. All right, guys. Take care. Thank you. Rob DeToma. Yes, I got it right. Third time in a row. Yes, it was good. It was good. Great interview, by the way. Um, When we come back, we'll get more into uh, what's going on in the MLB next. And then we're going to have our next uh, next guest, um, Richmond Spiders baseball head coach, Tracy Woodson, here on Down to the Wire. It's the Worldwide Sports Radio Network. You're, 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 you're listening to Down to the Wire on the Worldwide Sports Radio Network. What? Get it. Get it. Get it. Speedy, what? Snug the cat is a pain in the butt. What? 631-965-4990. Here we go. This is Down to the Wire. As you guys know, we are live Monday and Tuesday, 6 to 8, New York Eastern Sun and Time. And I'm going to tell you that I like to run. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> www.worldwidesportsradio.com. I am not a rapper, ladies and gentlemen. I'm just a talk show host. I like to have a little fun. As you guys know... We are always live, Monday through Friday, and there's we have some great shows. Shout out to Ryan Hickey on his great, great, fabulous show this morning on The Morning Boys. He gave us some good intake of onside kicks. And really, uh, what everything is going on in sports, and there are things going on in sports. It's just 
it's just not what we expect at this time of year when we talk about the March madness that we, we've we missed and, mm-hmm. and the NHL and NBA playoffs, which we'll get into a little bit later in the show, and, and we definitely got to get into that. But this particular story for the New York Jets, and I know I said we were going to get into baseball. We're going to push that off until we're done with our interview with Tracy Woodson. I, I do want to get into this story because the Jets added a backup quarterback this uh this weekend to the New York Jets roster, and it's no other than Super Bowl champion Joe Flacco. And I love this move by the New York Jets and Joe Douglas. Not the fact that you're only paying him $1.5 million, and this guy will probably be one of the best backups in the NFL right now. This is a guy that can help Sam Donald grow. And Joe Douglas, who comes from the Baltimore Ravens organization, who was a part of drafting Joe Mm -hmm. Flacco in the time that he was drafted, it gives them a, a reliable source for a young quarterback to go to, which he didn't have last year. Where, and I, I don't want to hear about Trevor Simeons. Trevor Simeons is a quarterback. He was a, a real, he was a backup quarterback his whole career. This guy was a seventh round draft pick and he's, he never won anything. Yeah. Joe Flacco won a Super Bowl. Joe Flacco was a Super Bowl MVP. This is a guy that was a big part of the reason why the Baltimore Ravens won a Super Bowl. That was one of the best postseason performances you'll ever see from a quarterback, the one he put up in 2012 when they were a four seed. It gives the Jets uh, a quarterback that's going to help this young guy really start to develop under Adam Gase's offense. And I know Joe Flacco didn't play under Adam Gase, but he understands the fast-paced offense that Adam likes to run, and he likes to use the running game and what did the Baltimore Ravens love to do? They loved to run the ball. It seemed like when Flacco was there, besides Ray Rice, who was really the only feature back they had, they kept rotating different backs, too. So Flacco had to deal with all that when it was one year of Justin Forsett and then Lorenzo Taliaferro, Alex, Alex Collins. He had to deal with all that. So if Adam Gase rotates the running backs like we know him to do, he'll be used to that. It's going to help the New York Jets, especially if Sam gets hurt again this year. This is a problem the Jets have had year in and year out with the quarterback position. And... Uh, they like to bring in veteran quarterbacks for under Sam Donald over the last couple of years, and it has worked, and it has helped Sam development. So I think that bringing in Joe Flacco, a guy that's won a Super Bowl, that has the background of a championship competitive player, well, it's going to help this kid grow. It's going to help some of the older players and younger players, especially C.J. Mosley, who played uh, with Joe Flacco over the last couple of years before he came to the New York Jets. Rashad Perriman, too. Yeah, so it, it gives them a little bit of a voice, not only in the locker rooms, but it helps Sam Donald out that he has somebody that he can trust on the bench that could give him some information if he can't answer the, you know, the questions or the play calling and the audibles at the line of scrimmage. Joe Flacco can absolutely help him. So I think this was a great Jets move and, and just hope that Sam Donald could stay on his two feet that you don't have the opportunity to see a guy like Flacco this coming year. But so, even so, it's a better insurance policy than what they had last year. So if Donald does get that injury-prone label, I know last year was more of a freak thing with the mono, but he was hurt the year before. So if he gets that injury-prone label, at least they have a, a very suitable back. A reliable now. quarterback yeah. who, who could play the offense and could help out if Sam can't play a game or two this year. I hope that doesn't happen. I hope Sam plays for 16 games because the Jets need it. They absolutely need a guy that's going to be reliable year in and year out, which Sam has not been the first two years of his career. Hopefully we get an opportunity to see Sam really grow at the position with the New York Jets, and bringing in Joe Flacco as a backup only helps them in the future, especially if they decide to bring him back another year, because Joe says he wants to play two or three more years. So I don't think he'll ever be a starting quarterback in the league again, but to be a qualified backup quarterback for, for the future, especially for the New York Jets, it only helps the Jets and the organization grow uh, as they move forward, Joe Douglas as the GM. Especially, too, is with him being a very different type of quarterback than Darnold was in his prime, too. He can help grow in terms of those other areas as well. We have our first caller of the day, and I know everybody knows this guy, and we know him as Jeff, a.k.a. Jeff from Tampa. What's going on, Jeff? Only Jets fans can do this, right? Like, only Jets fans can spin Joe Flacco. The Joe Flacco signing is being a good thing. Like, how, how, does anyone how could you that? not think Joe Flacco is not a good signing for $1.5 million as a backup? Okay, well, well, he lost his job to a guy that couldn't throw two years ago, right? Because at the time, Lamar Jackson wasn't an MVP. And Lamar Jackson broke the season. He was a quarterback that couldn't throw the football. Jeff, are you on your headsets? Are you on your headset? 
There you go. I think we're going to get you better. There you are. That's better. That's better. Go ahead. job to a quarterback that couldn't throw two years ago. Then he went to the Broncos and was so terrible that he couldn't even beat out a bad Drew Locke for the Broncos job. And now he needed neck surgery, and somehow he's a reliable backup. We're going to spin that. Like, I realize the name Joe Flacco has been passion. Joe Flacco's a Super Bowl winner. But I think everyone's remembering five, six years ago Joe Flacco and not the current Joe Flacco. Uh, again, Jeff, nobody is taking shots at you on your thoughts of Joe Flacco and where Joe Flacco is in his career. But Joe Flacco is a reliable backup quarterback. And for you to think, I think we lost him. Jeff, are you still there? Yeah. Oh, okay. Right. I thought we lost you. But not to say that, and I, 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 I do agree with you, a lot of Jet fans are probably blowing this out of proportion <laughs> that uh, Joe Flacco signs with the New York Jets and he's a reliable quarterback. But again, the Jets have not had a hand, healthy Sam Donald, and, and the Jets don't expect that Joe Flacco is ever going to have an opportunity to step on the field. But having Trevor Simeons, having the quarterbacks they had last year, adding Joe Flacco is a better uh, a better option than going with uh, Trevor Simeons again or going after somebody of that magnitude. There are no great backup quarterbacks in the league except maybe Ryan Fitzpatrick, a journeyman, or uh, maybe if you brought Cam Newton. But Cam Newton don't want to be a backup quarterback. So there really aren't a lot of reliable. And Andy Dalton wanted to go to Dallas because he lives in Dallas and he feels better and more proper over there in Dallas than he would probably with the New York Jets. So, is Andy Dalton really that much better than Joe Flacco, though, at this I, point? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, but I'm, I, I bet you Jeff thinks so. No, I would definitely think Andy Dalton is better. Like, again, you guys are – how are you guys, like, not even paying attention to the last two seasons? Joe Flacco lost his job to a quarterback that could not go in Baltimore. Then he lost his job to a guy that couldn't even play last year and drew up. How are you guys ignoring the recent history and then saying, oh, but it's a good sign. Like, all you're doing is living off of – Five years ago, he's a backup quarterback, Jeff. He is a backup quarterback. He is not expected to play this year. He's a guy that's going to be sitting the bench and helping Sam grow as a quarterback. How do you not think that this is a good signing? This is a good signing for the Jets. Yeah, it's not like they overpaid him either. Well, then hire him as a coach because honestly, I think you're also forgetting he's not even cleared to play football right now. No, he's not. But they brought him in for one point five or one point six million dollars. If he's healthy enough to play this year, it's a good move for the Jets. If he isn't, it's a good move still for the Jets. Listen, having someone there with knowledge that can teach him, yes, I agree, would be a good idea. But like in on, like the unfortunate circumstance that Sam Darnold, if or when or whatever, and I'm not wishing it upon him, but if he got hurt, right? You wouldn't want Joe Flacco on the field. Uh, again, I don't. I, I'd rather Joe Flacco than Trevor Simeons. I would rather Joe Flacco than that kid uh, Luke Falk. <laughs> Luke Falk last year. I, I yeah. I, I would rather Joe Flacco than even the kid Morgan, who they drafted this year. That I obviously think he's not ready to be a backup. And I think bringing in Joe Flacco just gives him a name on the bench that players respect, a guy that's won a Super Bowl. He was a Super Bowl MVP. And this is a guy that had one of the most prestige, one of the greatest runs in NFL history in the playoffs. So, and locker room leader, too. And a locker room leader that can help Sam Donald out over there in that that quarter of that at, at that position. So... I like the move. I know you don't like the move, and I'm not blowing the move out of proportion like you are. I, I get it. Like, hiring him for his knowledge is terrific. Like, I understand that. Like, and I'm fully on board with that. But for $1.5 million, you could have hired him to be the most expensive quarterback coach in the league for $1.5 million and gone and find someone that could play. Uh, it's just, to me, again, my argument isn't that Joe Flacco isn't a reliable quarterback this year. My question is, is he going to be a reliable quarterback when the Jets need him? And right now, they don't need him. And, and to bring him in for $1.5, $1.6 million, this was a good move for the New York Jets. The question is, is he going to be cleared? Is he going to be ready for the season? Is there going to be a season? And hopefully, we don't get a chance to see him on the field when he is qualified to go on the field. So, 
Again, you might not like it, but as a Jet fan or even Jet fans out there that are sitting back and saying, who are we going to bring in as our backup quarterback? Are we going to bring up a fourth-round draft pick we don't even know can play in the NFL? Or are we going to bring Trevor Simeon or Luke <laughs> Falk or one of those quarterbacks back? And hopefully, we, we're going to just hopefully hopefully throw a piece of you-know-what against the wall and hopefully it sticks. Again, I think we're in agreement. I think bringing Joe Flacco in for his knowledge, just his knowledge and his ability to teach, is a good move. Like, that's a good move. But you can't ignore Joe Flacco's actual body of work for the past two seasons and sit there and say, "Oh, that's that's a good that's a good quarterback we brought." It's going to be it's going to be very very interesting, Jeff. Call back. We have Tracy Woodson joining us in just a few minutes. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Oh my God! Every time he calls, just such an interesting guy. And by the way, when he's on the phone, when he ends, you pull it out, Speedy. Don't let the go. Don't let it be heard on air that you are on the phone with him. Okay. Anyways, uh, up next, baseball Richmond Spiders baseball head coach Tracy Woodson played for the 1988 World Series champion L.A. Dodgers. We're going to talk about his career in the major leagues and his career as a head coach. Where does he see himself in the future, either in the major leagues, college rankings, or wherever he decides he plans to go in the future? We're going to have Tracy on in just a few moments here on Down to the Wire. It is the Worldwide Sports Radio Network. You're, 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 you're listening, listening to Down, down to, to the, the Wire. wire. On the Worldwide Sports Radio Network. Six three one nine six five four nine nine zero. This is down to the wire. We are live every single Monday through Tuesday from eight six p.m. to eight p.m. New York Eastern Time. As you guys know, remember. You can call us at 631-965-4990. We have our second guest, and I want to apologize for putting him on hold. Uh, it's just been a crazy, crazy day. And uh, this is a guy that's been very well touted and, and really as a head coach uh, in the college rankings. And we are now talking to Richmond Spiders baseball head coach, Tracy Woodson. What's going on, Tracy? How you doing, guys? We are good, man. How are you and your family go? You know, with everything that's going on with this pandemic, uh, have you guys been uh, social distancing and everything that's going on? Yeah, we've uh, we've probably been together a little bit longer than we <laughs> probably would like to at some point. So, um, my wife and my daughter actually just left to get some basketball. Shoot, my daughter plays uh, high school basketball, so she just went to get some shooting in right now. So. They left me at my house with my with my son. So <laughs> I'm sure you're happy about that. So, Tracy. Yeah, I gotta- Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I just said, yeah, get them out of the house, and we're, we're together two months, so we're a little bored here. Oh, I, I can only imagine. I get to sit next to this guy every single day for our show, so that's enough for me. Two hours of that is just enough for me. Then we push him away. <laughs> Anyways, uh, we are talking to Richmond Spiders baseball head coach Tracy Woodson. Tracy, tell us a little bit about your team and the growth right now of your college and your baseball team? Well, we're, uh, we're in the Atlantic 10, so I know you had Rob on earlier, who used to be at Fordham before he went to Fairleigh Dickinson, and Fordham's in our conference. And, uh, you know, we just you know, try to plug along now. It, it, you know, you're in a dead period now. The NCAA has extended the dead period now um, through the end of June, so there's, there's no going out recruiting. There's no games to see anyway. But, um, you know, we're just we're, we're on the phone a lot, you know, talking to recruits and, um, just trying to get to get what we can, and um, we Zoom Zoom meeting, which I've never done before. I'm learning a lot about computers and all this technology, but we Zoom um, once a week with our guys and um, with new guys now as well. Uh, they'll be coming in next year, so um, you're still doing still doing some stuff at home, um, trying to keep busy with it, and, and, and kind of trying to keep your hand on uh, you know on the program. Your program this year and the small sample size that I did get to play this year, they hung tough with a number four ranked team in Georgia. Do you think that's something that stands out as something that can definitely have this program take the next step, even though they did get swept just hanging tough, or are you not somebody that believes in moral victories like that? No, um, you know, I'm a, I, I'm, I, we, we're supposed to go to South Carolina next year. We, we do it every year. We, we're going to play somebody. 
Um, you know, we played Virginia, we played Duke every year, so we we want to challenge our guys and get them ready for conference play. And um, you know, we felt confident this year. We were missing a couple arms that were hurt, uh, but we went down to Georgia opening night, and um, the Hancock kick for Georgia is the number one uh, MLB rated prospect. He could go number one overall. We faced him the first night. We, you know, we put up six and four and a third on him, and we swung the bats well. We had the lead. We gave up two in the bottom of the ninth and lost opening night. Once that happens, you know, for you know, I, I know Rob was talking about it a little bit for a mid-major. It's it's very disappointing. That for me, that's not a moral victory. Uh, you know, we had the game the game in hand. Um, the next day, I think we lost seven to two, but we came back uh, on Sunday had a four to one lead. And just our bullpen has, has been our problem all year long, and. Uh, we, we just couldn't hold the 4-1 lead. I think we lost 5-4. So um, we played well, but um, injuries killed us uh, the rest of the way. And um, you know, when you get into that, you you just you've got to have depth pitching wise. And we just weren't very good at it this year. We like I said, we had three or four guys that were out that were, you know, two of them are two of our main guys in the bullpen, and we just had nobody to go to. Now, we were speaking with Rob a little bit a little while ago, and we were talking about pitching and how it's been a it's it's the most important position of, of teams right now in the major leagues, and a lot of people are trying to find that right-hander, that power left-hander that they can bring up and, and really become a big-time prospect in the major leagues. Are you looking for those top pitchers, or are you looking for those guys that, those those grunt work workers, those guys that can bunt the ball, that can get on base, and do the things in the field that you expect these players to do defensively? Well, we're not, we're not going to get the top 10 draft pick out of high school. That's just <laughs> not going to happen. They're going to go, you know, they're going to go to the Power Five schools. And, um, you know, we try to find their, you know, we'll try to find that guy that's hidden away a little bit. But just nowadays, you, you know, if you're good, somebody's going to find you and they're going to find you. So, um, you know, we try to find the guy that we see that, you know, may be a six foot three, 160 pound, you know, being, uh, you know, looking thing. And we hope he's going to, you know, I look at his mom and dad to see how tall and big they are and we kind of project. And, you know, if you can find an 85, 86 mile hour kid like that and, the biggest thing, you know, you you got to have you got to have all speed. You got to have a breaking ball. You got to have a changeup. You got to be able to throw strikes. And if you can get those kids and and hopefully they mature physically and you know you bring them along and and those those can be, become your guys. It's just most of those guys aren't going to be that way as a freshman. So um, you know you're playing power fives that they're throwing out 93 to 95 every guy. I mean, you know we played Louisville three years ago. We had them. You know we lost three to two. But I mean every one of their bullpen guys is six four six five. And, you know, they're just bringing one more. One, here, you know, you're not going to get around now. Here comes the next one. And, and they're just, it's just, it's just power arms all over. We just don't have that. So, you know, you got a great guy. And then, you know, offensively, we, we've got a couple guys that, you know, that can hit the ball. And, um, but you've got, you're not going to have nine of them usually. So you got to have somebody at the bottom of the door that can handle that. You know, I, I don't like the bun a lot, but if I have to, we're not scoring runs. We'll do that. And we'll try to manufacture it. Um, so it, it you know, it's the situation, you know, when it occurs, that's, that's how you react. I asked this question to Rob, and now I'm going to ask it to you as a, a coach that is not in a Power 5 conference. Now, obviously, the A-10 is one of the better mid-major conferences, but is there, is there any different strategies when you're managing that kind of game against, like we were saying, against Georgia? Is there anything different you do significantly strategy-wise because you don't have the talent as much? I, I think... I think we play for runs early in the game. You try to do that see if you can stay in the game. Um, you know, it's, you, you just, I think the biggest thing is you don't want to get blown out, you know, and I, I'll tell my, you know, my assistant, my pitching coach, you know, if, if it's six to four in the six, I'm going to bring in a good arm. I'm not bringing in my you know, if it's play for tomorrow. Um, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to end up being 17 to four, um, you know, that type of thing. I want to stay in the game, but I think early you try to score runs and you get ahead. Um, you, you never know what's going to happen because, especially for that, I mean, opening week, those guys are just as nervous as our kids are. Um, you know, we walked in on Thursday night to, to work out before we opened up on Friday. You know, our guys are, you know, this, it's, it's unbelievable. You know, the field's unbelievable. It's, it's you know, plush. You know, our guys, and I, I joke around with the guys. I, you know, don't, you know, and I, I, I'll watch my language. I tell my guys, be careful, you know, crap on the field, but, <laughs> you know, because they're so nervous. So, you know, you, you got to relax them a little bit, but you know that other team is the same as you are. It's opening night. You got the butterflies or the jitters, uh, but just have fun. And you know, when we got out and we jumped ahead, you know, you could you could see the the the, bulk, uh, the, the dugout excitement 
and you got now you got to now you got to continue. You got to continue. You got to. It's nine innings to just. It's hard to get three out, you know, in the seventh inning and the eighth inning, and it's it's just hard to do. You know, the outs get harder as the game goes on. So, uh, but you know, we were excited about you know how we competed for those three games, and uh, you know after that weekend. We are talking to Richmond Spiders baseball head coach Tracy Woodson. Now, I, I know the relief pitcher has become a big part of the major leagues and the opener, and it's really transitioned the game, and you see guys like Garrett Cole getting that $326 million contract, the biggest contract in baseball history, uh, history for a pitcher. I don't think you'll ever see a contract like that, especially with the relief pitching. Do you look at the relief pitcher as important now in the major leagues as the starting pitcher? I think the relief pitching in the big leagues right now is more important than any starter because that- you know, nowadays it's five or six innings and they're out. You've got your sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth. you got four bullpen arms that are probably better than the starting pitcher. Uh, you know, now, you're not, I'm not talking about a Verlander, the Garrett Coles, and those guys. But, you know, when you're getting into the fourth, fourth and fifth starter, your arms in the bullpen are better than that. Um, and I think that they just want to lead by the fifth or the sixth. And, you know, the, you got all the, you know, the stats and, you know, the, the, the percentages and the numbers and all that stuff. And, they're looking at that, and they've got it all planned ahead. I mean, that's you know they, they say once you get to the third time through, you know if you're not a, if you're not a top level pitcher, it's hard to go the, you know through that lineup three times. So, um, you know that's I think it makes it easier. It takes a lot of pressure off the managers in the big leagues, you know, because they're going to say, oh, gosh, you know, this guy threw his six innings and you know he did a great job. I'm going to go to this guy, this guy, and this guy. We're going to close it out. I mean, that's how I remember back. I played with John Wetland in the in the minor leagues. I remember them before he became the closer. It was it was Wetland, and then you go to Mariano Rivera. Nobody started scoring the eighth and the ninth off the Yankees back then. So I think you know you've got those arms now in the seventh, eighth, and ninth, and you know guys are going to close that out. Are there any differences? Do you think with the relief pitcher strategy as a whole, the bullpen strategy from college baseball into pro baseball, and also do being it's a shorter season, a a thirty something game season, depending on how far you go with the conference tournaments. Is it is it different in terms of managing maybe innings, how far starters can go in the game, stuff like that? Uh, I mean, yeah, your, your starters are your best arms in college uh, by far. Um, you know, we had a, we had a closure two years ago that if he came in the game, the game was over. Um, I think he gave up one earned run all year, and it was it was ninety four to ninety six. Um, and, and but nowadays you're trying to you're trying to push your starter as far as you can without getting hurt. You know, I'm not going to hurt any of my arms. You know, just to win a baseball game, but they are your best pitchers. If you try to leave them as long as you can, and then you just try to, you know, do a work patch type thing with the, with the bullpen. You know, we may have a guy that we think is the closer, and you know, when you come out of you know your spring workout and before you start the season, you know, we're we're trying to figure out okay, who's my lefty matchup, who's my righty matchup, who's my setup, who's my close. Most of the colleges, you know, at the mid major level don't don't have all those. They're going to go to their best arms and try to go two, three innings if they have to, you know, with the closer, you know, and then try to bring them back if it's a Friday night. Because, you know, the most important for the for us is conference weekend. And you're playing probably Saturday, Sunday. So I'm trying to get my guy, win that Friday night game with a couple innings and then rest him on Saturday and bring it back on Sunday. Um, you know, because in ours, it, it, it all comes down to the, you know, to the tournament. You know, who's the hottest team that, you know, four or five days for our conference tournament is going to win that tournament and go to the NCAA tournament. So, um, you know, that's how we, that's kind of how we do it here at Richmond. Looking at your career as a professional baseball player, and you were a part of the 1988 World Series champions, uh, the LA Dodgers. And, and what the Dodgers are doing now than they ever have is they're building their farm system. They have one of the top farm systems in baseball right now. And you look at some of the players like or- or Oral Hershiser that played with you, Don Sutton, Kirk Gibson, Fernando Valenzuela, all these young players at the time or veteran players in the prime of their careers. Do you see the Dodgers getting to that top of, you know, top of the mountain again? I mean, this is a team that's had opportunity after opportunity and fallen apart in the playoffs, maybe because Houston was cheating. I don't know. Or maybe it was just because of their lack of coaching or a lack of producing in the big game. Do you think that this team has the qualities of your team in 1988 did as World Series champions? Well, they definitely, I mean, talent-wise, they have a, they have more talent than we had. Um, you know, we won 90 games, I think. We beat the Mets, we won 103. We beat the A's, who had won 104. But we had, you know, Hershey's had the, you know, his career year. You know, Gibson was one of the greatest leaders I've ever played with. 
Um, you know, he gets one at bat in the World Series, and everybody knows what he did with that one at bat. But um, you, you got guys that knew their roles. You know, I wasn't a starter, but I was ready to do whatever the Florida asked me to do. We had a bunch of those guys. Um, and so we were we were a different team. We weren't – I think we were 1-10 or 1-11 against the Mets throughout that year during the season. We'd only beat them once. And it was probably – I'm, I'm seeing those games. I get text messages, and um, this the last two months during this pandemic, I'm getting text messages because all the games are on, so they're showing the greatest games of all time, and they're showing some of the, the Mets playoff games that great championship series. They're showing, you know, of course, game one of the World Series in 88. And so I'm, I'm getting to see replays of it a lot, and it just it brings back great memories just because we had a great team chemistry uh, amongst us. We didn't care who did the job, who did what. Uh, it was about winning, but. You know, obviously, Hershey is a carry this, and Gibson did what he did. So, um, you know, we did have those two guys. But a lot of the others were Patch Burke and, uh, you know, not a lot of all-stars in the team. But the Dodgers now, I mean, they're they're loaded. I mean, you know, they're, they're, they've got all-stars almost sitting on their bench. Um, I, I think it's for them, it's just it, the pitching has got to, you know, it's got to be consistent. And, you know, I think Kershaw has got to kind of get over, you know, whatever it is in the playoffs. I mean, he's got great stuff now. I don't see Kershaw giving up what he did against the Astros and now knowing that, you know, they were tipping pitches. That could have been a different story because Kershaw, Kershaw doesn't get let up like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, I think that was a different situation once you find out, you know, what was going on because, you know, that team's pretty damn good. You played for one of the best managers that baseball's ever seen in Tommy Lasorda. What was the biggest thing that stood out to him as a manager and as a person when you were there? Well, I also played for Tory in St. Louis. Yes, so you did. I played, for, mm-hmm. I played for two of the greatest managers, and they were completely different. Um, Tommy was the raw, raw. Um, he would listen to Hershiser and Sosha, you know, a lot on the bench. He relied on his coaches a lot. Um, you know, Tory was a guy to just sit back, let you play the game. He was relaxed. You know, Tommy, gosh, Tommy would be on the top step looking in the stands to see if you know, Barbara Streisand or Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, who was in the stands that night. I mean, it was like that all the time. You know, Lasorda was the most laid back. You know, you walk around, you put you in the lineup. There's no yelling. If he had an issue with you, he called you in the office, you talk about it. Um, so it, it, it was it was, it was was different in both both situations, but they both worked. And, you know, I think I, I, try to do, I try to do both of those. And I want my guys to be able to go out and play. And, you know, if, if you make it – my biggest thing is, is young kids nowadays, man, they expect to get a hit every time. It ain't going to happen. You know, you may hit 500 in high school. I promise them, I don't even care if you're here, you're not hitting 500 at Richmond. So I let my guys know if you get an 0 for 4, man, you're going to get four more at max tomorrow. And I think that's where the guys and the players respect the coaches and what you try to tell them. Pitchers, you're, you're not going to throw an eight inning shutout for eight, you know, and then, and then next weekend you're going to come back and throw seven shutout. You're going to get let up one night and, or one day and, you know, you have to get over it and be ready to go back in five or six days whenever the next time you should get the ball. So, um, you know, you go back to talking about closers. You know, Eckersley it, it gives up the home run to Gibson, and LaRusso said, if we're in that situation tomorrow night, he's getting the ball again. That, that's what you've got to do. That, that's where these guys know their role. Now, the one thing is, that's because we never threw another pitch in that series, which is unbelievable because he's the best reliever in baseball. But, uh, you know, I think taking those things from those guys and, I went to the mound every time I'm in the game, and whether I was playing first base or third base, any time the manager or the pitch coach came out, I always went to the mound. <laughs> I wanted to hear what they were saying. I wanted to learn, you know, what they were talking about. And some of it's funny, you know, some of it's serious, some of it's, you know, strategic. Um, but, I, you know, I, I try to do that. I don't go to the mound. Most of the time, I don't go to the mound unless I'm taking the guy out. Sometimes I want to go up there and see how the kid reacts. And I can see the one kid goes, don't take me out. And he's looking me in the eyes. I'm leaving that kid in there and giving him a chance. And I think, you know, that's that's kind of the stuff I learned. And I, I try to, you know, that's how I try to do my stuff right now. We are talking to Richmond Spiders head coach, Tracy Woodson. Now, Tracy, there's two questions I have, multiple questions right here. One of them is from one of our fans named Carl. He wants to know if you have any superstitions. And here's another question. With, with the transition of the game and the change of some of the baseball rules with the electronic umpire, do you like these changes? And if you don't like these changes, do you have any ideas how you could speed up the game where it can make it better? Are we talking in, in the big leagues or are we talking in college? I would, say, got, col- I, I would say opinions on all of it. I, I would say college and the big leagues. I, I like to know your opinion on both well, of them. Uh, superstitions, I tried to wear the same T-shirt 
every night. <laughs> if I had a good night, if we win, I made sure that T-shirt got washed within my locker. I wore it. I wore it. If I went on duty, if I went into a slump, I'd pull out another one. Um, on, on deck circle, I took the same number of practice swings. If I swung the bat with my right arm getting loose over my head, I did it three times. I did it with my left hand three times. Things like stupid things like that were kind of my superstitions. <laughs> um, I can't stand. I don't. I can't stand ever even thinking about using uh, 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 an electronic umpire. This is a human game. This is human error, human mistakes. But, you know, I don't know if you guys. I've refereed college basketball at the Power Fives for 14 years. I refereed the SEC for 14 years, and I had some of the top college basketball coaches in my ear. You know, if I made a mistake, I went over. I, heck, I tell them. I do the same with umpires. You know, I'll say something to the umpire. These guys are going to make mistakes. Now, you can't make mistakes, you know, four or five times in a game. Uh, but that, that's part of it. So I, I tell my kids, you know, my players come back and go, that pitch was outside. I said, what about the two you swung out in the dirt? <laughs> so you, you, you do have to throw some ownership onto these players because most of them, you know, a lot of kids think they're entitled, but they need to learn. You know, the parents, the parents coddle the kids. You know, they think they're this or that. We try to bring them to a level of, let's, let's take some, you know, let's take some uh, responsibility for every attack, for every error we make. What did we do wrong? What, what, so that I think that's kind of been, you know, straight up. But the the, the umpiring, the umpiring is fine. I mean, they've got a tough job now with, I mean, with the cameras that are everywhere. I mean, you, you can't miss a pitch by a quarter of an inch because it fills the ball on the outside of the strike zone by, you know, by a half an inch. That's part of the game. Um, you know, I, I just I can't stand the speeding up of the game in college baseball is wearing the, the stupid wristbands now because you know you got to give them signals so nobody steals the signs and all that. I get that with the catcher. They're talking about now getting an earpiece to where the coaches can talk into the earpiece to call pitches so nobody steals signs. Love that idea. But we're getting to the point now where everybody on the field is wearing a wristband and you know they're given numbers for signs third base. You know, that's, that's not baseball. You know, that's not baseball. Just come up with signs that, you know, they can't steal. You know, come up with whatever you do, you know, when you're getting signs so people don't steal the signs. That's why the college game takes forever. Um, you, you know, the, the coaches, I think the coaches are trying to take too much control over the game and running every aspect of it instead of letting the kids go out and play the game. Um, get, give your sign, let them do what they've got to do, and let's, let's play. Um, and, and I think, you know, Pro ball, I managed seven years in pro ball from rookie ball to triple A. Um, you know, it's, it's basically, you know, they, you let them go out, you, you know, you try to win the game, but your prospects are going to be the most of the guys that are going to play anyway. And you let's see what they could do at the end of the game. But, you know, a lot of these organizations do put them in when you're in the seventh or eighth inning. When they go to the big leagues, they're not hitting in the third spot as they are in double A AA or triple A. They're probably hitting seventh or eighth. I learned that quickly. You know, I was hitting third or fourth in triple A. I go to the big leagues, I'm hitting seventh. So I better learn how to get a bunt down. I'm not going to be there long. Tommy would have sent me back quickly, you know, back to AAA if I don't get a bunt down. So, you know, there, there's so many differences in the college game compared to the pro game. And, uh, now with the analytics, it's, it's, it's going overboard. Uh, and I think, you know, it, it's, it's got to the point where some of these guys are almost like robots. Last question for me. The college transfer portal has been very active in a lot of other sports. It hasn't really been – in terms of the rules of baseball, it hasn't been too much with baseball, but we're seeing it a lot with uh, basketball, especially right after this whole pandemic has had the instant impact uh, in terms of a transfer. Do you want that in, in baseball as a coach? Do you want that in terms of getting new players, kind of like a free agency type thing where they don't have to wait a year like they are now having in basketball, or do you want it to go stay the way it is? Uh, you know, I, I think it's going to be, you know, I think the repo comes in January and, it's going to happen. It's going to be a one-year transfer, free rule, and you know I think uh, you know it's going to affect. It's going to affect everybody. You know there's going to be there are a lot of kids right now that go to Power Five that you know they get recruited and they you know somebody you know one of the big schools gets them and they go there and they realize there's four other guys that play that position that are just as good as them, and it's going to be whichever one out you know beats out the other one, and then those guys are going to be unhappy. They're going to transfer, same as you know same as at Richmond or wherever else you're talking about. The kids that don't play aren't happy. And, you know, I think it starts to where they're not – they don't come in and they, they – once again, I go back to, you know, they think they're supposed to be given this job or, you know, this position. And that's not just – that's just not the way it is. You've got to come in and earn the spot and then stick it out. 
You know, if you're not good enough, you're not good enough. That's fine. And we have to make that decision sometimes. And, you know, my job and my coach's job is to put the best nine guys out there, give us the best chance to win. You know, and I, I all my guys know their roles. I know, they know who the right-handed pitch hitter is. They know who the left-handed pinch hitter is. You know, who my, uh, you know, pinch, pinch runner might be. Uh, my bullpen guys pretty much know, you know, they're pitching earlier in the game or later in the game. So, uh, but the, the transfer portal is, is huge in every sport. Um, it's, it's not just the, 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 the big football and basketball. So it's, it's every sport. Um, and it's going to, it's going to continue that way. And if this rule passes in January, then, uh, you know, I see, I see a lot more kids moving on. We are talking to Richmond Spiders baseball head coach, Tracy Woodson. Tracy, last question for me. Uh, the development, the development of some of these young players coming into the major leagues and, and the positioning of what these players play. And you have pitchers that become shortstops after they get drafted and shortstop becoming pitchers, Jacob DeGrom being one of them. Do you see a particular player coming from college right now that you have cited that is the next big thing or maybe a, a, a guy that could play another position if he, if he gets drafted by one of these uh, big top uh, major league uh, organizations? A particular player, yes. One player in, in mind, yes. I, I don't, I, I don't pay attention to that. <laughs> and not good that we faced. The first pitch he threw in the game was ninety-eight, and wow. you know there were scouts all over the place. That kid was legit. We hit him, you know, we we knocked him around a little bit, uh, but the, the kid's a big one. Um, that's the one guy. I, I don't really pay attention. You know, I'll watch the draft. I will watch it um, just to see. You know, five rounds now. You're you're there's going to be a lot of guys that aren't going to be drafted that were probably projected in the top 20 rounds that are good baseball players. I mean, if you go back and look at some of the guys that were drafted, you know, what was batting late, 21st round maybe, or, you know, when you go back to some of these guys that were drafted late, you're not going to have that this year. There could be a lot of guys going back to college that are really good. So it's, it's, it's just, a, it's a, it's, it's a crap shoot now for five rounds. They got their work cut out for us and uh, for themselves now uh, with, with who they pick. Well, I will say this, Tracy. You gave us some great information, what's going on in the college rankings, uh, the major leagues, and, and really your background. You still have that World Series ring? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, absolutely. I got, I, got an, I, I got one with the Marlins also when they beat the Yankees because I was the double-A manager oh, um, hmm. that year as well. So I do, I do have that one. Oh, so you got two so rings. I was, and... I was hoping you guys would ask me about Flacco because I'm – I. Let me tell you, I, I'll talk to you about any sport there is except for uh, auto racing. Really? So I, I I could sit here and listen and talk about it all day. And, I, I you know, I know y'all were talking about Flacco, and that's why, you know, I'm a big Redskins fan. I know that's probably not good in your area. But, <laughs> uh, but, when I was growing, but when I was growing up, Redskins are winning Super Bowls with Joe Gibbs. And, that's true. You know, so I, it's, it's been a long, long hiatus before the Redskins have done anything. No, when uh, Todd Bowles was the so. defensive uh, defensive player of the year. There you go. <laughs> That's right. Maybe you guys you need know, to just John start a GoFundMe page to have Dan John Snyder Riggins. sell the team. <laughs> they hand the ball to John Riggins, and uh, you know, so but I, I, you know, I love, I love, I love talking sports, and I'm a big Blackhawks hockey fan. Okay. Uh, so I, I love it, man. I know you guys have all the sports up there, and I, I, I visit tremendously. You know, I'm watching golf yesterday. Oh God! I turned on the I turned on the auto racing from Charlotte. <clears throat> I, I couldn't only last for five minutes. They've gone around three or four times, and I uh, was bored. So, uh, do you like the Flacco move back. by the Jets? Uh, as a backup, yes, I do. Uh, you know, you're not going to have you're not going to have somebody with that kind of experience. Um, you know, I I still don't think their starter is you know cemented in yet. I, I just I just don't. Um, so you've got to have somebody you can go to. You know, I. I, the Redskins have had Colt McCoy forever, and he gets hurt. And you know, I just I don't know where they're going to go. Uh, you know, hopefully Haskins is the answer, but um, you know, it's a it's an awfully tough division. Uh, you know, the NFC East, and you know, gosh, the Jets finally uh, get good quarterback play. You can move down with Brady out of the league. Um, so I, you know, the Dolphins, everybody, everybody can win that division now because the the, the Patriots, I think, are vulnerable. So. Huh. I, I'll definitely, I definitely want to get you on uh, to talk a little bit more baseball when your season starts. But now that we know you like about we, we you like basketball, you like hockey, you like baseball. Well, maybe we'll get you on and talk a little bit other sports with us because so, I, I love, love your it. intake. I love your intake. 
I love it. Now, I, I love talking about it. I, I, I watch MMA. I saw you guys do. I, I went on it. Yeah. Time, you know, more about it. I know you got, you know, I'm not a, I don't like the arm bars and, you know, all that stuff. <laughs> but I like the, I like the, the excitement of the MMA and, you know, um, but I, I, you know, I, I love talking sports and this, this is That's great. Been fun for me. So thank you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, tell the fans how they can find you. Uh, and I know, uh, we, we're going to get Rob, uh, a lot of, uh, different fans to send them out some, uh, future stars in college that, uh, maybe you'll, you'll have the opportunity to scout. So why don't you tell the fans how they can reach you? Yes. You can get me at, at Tracy Woodson. You are, and then you can follow the team at Spike Baseball. There you go. There you guys go. I, I really appreciate you joining us, Tracy. Yeah, thanks a lot for having me. Thanks a lot for talking sports. Absolutely. As you guys know, that was Tracy Woodson. Great, great interview. Uh, he is the Richmond Spiders baseball head coach. Gave us good insight with everything, including uh, basketball and and, and, and I'm, I'm not basketball and football. Really, football. <laughs> Gave us some good insights. Uh, he's a Redskins fan, so uh, there's nothing wrong with that. We'll, we'll, we'll have some uh, we'll have some fights if he calls back. Or call, as a Carl Giants would fan. call them the Deadskins. <laughs> uh, when we come back, I, I want to know you got your guys' opinion on, as far as I'm concerned, the the ba- top baseball players of the decade and why they were the top players of the decade. When we come back, we're going to narrow it down to ten players, and we're going to tell you why they are the baseball players of the decade here. On down to the wire. It, it, it's the Worldwide Sports Radio Network. You're, 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 you're listening, listening to Down to, down to the, the wire. wire on the Worldwide Sports Radio Network. Six three one nine six five four nine nine zero. As you guys know, this is down to the wire. We are live Monday and Tuesday from six p.m. to eight p.m. New York Eastern Time. As you know, we have our show below the mic, which is also Thursday six uh, six p.m. to eight p.m. New York Eastern Time. And to this week, we do have our MMA show, Caged in MMA. Me and Anthony and Derosi. Uh, he will be joining me, and we will be arguing. All the Khabib crap that we're going to be hearing from all the fans throughout the country. And Arrow will probably bash Dana White in the beginning of the show. Well, I always like to, <laughs> well, I like to bash him one way or another. But uh, I'm looking forward to that show as well. We're going to have an ex, uh, well, we have an ex uh, UFC fighter joining us this week, and we have uh, a current UFC fighter that lost on the Saturday night card. So uh, I'm looking forward to getting uh, Mr. Hernandez to join us as well. So that'll be fun. Uh, hopefully uh, he will be joining us. He did lose his fight. And he's now waiting too. But uh, looking forward to his thoughts on his uh, f- uh, his last fight and his future endeavors in the UFC. But as you guys know, I wanted to get into this topic before our show was over. We're not going to have debate hour today. We'll have debate hour tomorrow. Who do we have on the show tomorrow? Tomorrow, tomorrow we have another. We have James Jones, mm-hmm. who's uh, the Yale basketball coach. Okay. Uh, tomorrow at six thirty. I forgot the other guy's name off the top of my head. I believe, That's right. I believe he's at seven, though. So, and we're going to have another coach. So that'll be mm-hmm. another coach. So we have this is coach week for us. Yeah, a lot of college coaches this week. So it'll be fun. And if you guys are a college, a college basketball, college baseball, college football fan, well, you'll like our show this week. So because we have a lot of great guests, we just had two really, really uh, good guests in uh, Mister Dit Tamoma Dit. Toma, I'm sorry. Yeah, you had a nice streak of three in yeah, a row. <laughs> Dip Toma, Mr. Rob Dip Toma, and we also had Tracy Woodson. Uh, it was a great, great, two really, really good interviews and uh, gave us some good insight in college rankings and the MLB rankings as well. Well, as you guys know, I want to go through our top ten um, players of the baseball decade, and we're going to tell you why we think they're top ten and the reasoning behind it. Are you ready, Speedy? Let's go. Let's go. Let's get it. All right, so number 10, here's one that I think gets undervalued because he hasn't been good in a while, but he was one of the more steady closers in this decade. I'm going to say Craig Kimbrell, number 10. He was dominant with Atlanta. And again, a lot, for a position for the the closing position that you see phases, you see a lot of guys are good for a little while, but then they, they'll phase out. Craig Kimbrell and one of the other guys I'll mention later were really the only two consistent closers in that time. Craig Kimbrell was borderline Cy Young candidate in some years with the Braves, some early... 
2010's Braves teams that were very good. So he's my number 10. He hasn't been as good lately for the Red Sox, but again, I would say from 2010 to 2017, he was much one of the most steady guys you know, uh, ever we've ever seen. My number 10 is Chris Sale. Uh, he's been one of the most dominant American League pitchers in the last 10 years. This is a guy that won an American League Cy Young. He won World Series. Uh, he won one World Series with the Boston Red Sox. This is a guy that's been a champion. And really, what he did with Chicago at the time that he did it, and, and especially demanding not to play. Remember that? Mm -hmm. When he didn't want to play with the, 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 the jersey, jersey, the, the jersey situation. Jersey, yep. I, I mean, this guy has been uh, a mindset not only for the pitching position and the way he throws the ball, the underarm. It, it's really the game is not the same that it once was, and the pitcher is not the same as it once was. So uh, I think Chris Sale, the, the, the dominance and the power pitching that he has provided in the last 10 years has been uh, remarkable. So he's my number 10. All right, number nine for me, Madison Bumgarner. I think he, he's a guy that hasn't been the amazing regular season pitcher, but again, that the postseason stuff has really just been putting him to another level. And again, he later on, he became a more steady regular season guy into 2013 through probably about 2017 before he had that ATV accident. So I think... He, what he's done in that time, you really have to give him a lot of credit for that postseason. It was the best World Series ERA that we've ever seen in 2014. And he was dominant even in 2010 when he was the fourth guy in that rotation. When they had Lincecum and they had Matt Cain, he was uh, very good in that postseason too. And that comeback, remember, they were fourth place at the All-Star break. So he's been very good for a while. And we'll see how he comes back now with the Diamondbacks. But again, probably outside of the last two seasons, he's really been a steady force in this entire decade and, again, dominant in the postseason. My number nine is another Boston Red Sox, Mr. Mookie Betts. And Mookie Betts, an MVP, and, and really, in the last six or six years, he's been one of the best hitters, hitters in baseball, one of the best defensive players in baseball, plays multiple positions, really a dominant player, especially in the World Series uh, that they won a couple of years ago. He was one of the best players on the team throughout the season, and that's why he won the MVP. And really, what this Boston Red Sox team over the last couple of years has just been uh, remarkable, and he's one of the main reasons why, and the main state of players that has been the reason why the Boston Red Sox in their dominance. So my number nine is Mookie Betts. All right, number eight for me, I'm going to say Yadier Molina. I think Yadier Molina, when you look at everything he's done, all the great defensive prowess that he has, working with a lot of different pitchers. The Cardinals change players a lot. We see them have a quick leash on a lot of their pitchers, and Yadier Molina's worked well with all of them. And in addition to that, he's also a good, great offensive catcher. Won a batting title, won an MVP, hit 300 or close to 300 a lot of his career. And even a couple of years ago, hit over, 20, uh, 20, I think, 22 home runs. So when you look at a steady dominance of a catcher, just one of the sm smartest, if not the smartest, baseball IQ in the league. And again, him, him just being so great defensively, at a position in the catcher where, again, it's undervalued, but it's very important on the field when, in terms of being the smartest guy and working with the pitchers and the other fielders. My number eight is also a catcher, but it's not Mr. Molina. It's Mr. Posey. And Mr. Posey, is one of the been, he's been one of the best dominant catchers in the last 10 years. He won a couple of World Series. He was a big part of those World Series runs. And really, with all the dominant pitching that the Giants have had, year in and year out with Bumgarner and all the different pitchers they've had over the years. He was one of the main guys and the, one of the main, main reasons why these pitchers produced and became the Cy Young candidates that he once was, was and were. So it's Buster Posey as my number eight. All righty. Number seven uh, out. Number seven for me, I will take the other closer I was talking about in Araldis Chapman. I think for a long time he was that other guy. He was the lefty version. Him and Kimbrough were on and off of who was the best closer in baseball. And again, both of them have been so consistent. I think Chapman surpassed him now uh, definitively, but it was always very close. And again, 106 miles an hour that he threw at Cincinnati. Again, he was on some good Cincinnati Reds teams in the early part of the decade. They kind of obviously fizzled out after that, but he was very consistent for a while. He then went to the Yankees, then he went, went to the Cubs, he went back to the Yankees. And obviously... He's been very steady for a very long time and, again, still has that velocity in him to be able to be just one of the most, most dominant closers. And probably another year or two, you could talk about him in the Hall of Fame discussion because he's got, he's got the monumental amount of saves, too. My number seven is Miguel Cabrera, Triple Crown winner, dominant player. And, and even if he has really died down as, as a player in the major leagues, especially with the Detroit Tigers his last couple of years, this guy has been one of the most dominant hitters in 2010 all the way to 2014 he was as good as anybody in the league and even though 
aging and, and really as the player that he once was. He's not anywhere close to the player that he once was. This is the last, he is the last player since Mickey Mantle to win a Triple Crown. So uh, it's it's a remarkable career, and I think Miguel Cabrera is, I wouldn't put him in my top five, but in my top ten, you have to put him there. I'm going to go with the number, for number six, I'm going to go with a guy with some very good longevity. How about Adrian Beltre? I mean, he, for a while, he was a dominant third baseman. How long he played? He was a rookie in 2004, and he ended, I think he only just retired in 2018. Steadily was healthy. Steadily, uh, he had a couple injury issues at the end of his career, but so steadily healthy, one of the best defensive third basemen at his time, and one of the more consistent hitters, great playoff player for the Rangers when they went to their back-to-back World Series. And I think, again, he's somebody, 3,000 hits, he's somebody that will definitely get into the Hall of Fame at some point. Or you would think in realistic standpoints, but who knows at this rate with the way the baseball writers are. So number six, I would, I'll say Adrian Beltre. Um, my number six is Adrian Beltre, too. I, I agree with you. I'm looking at some of his numbers. This guy is a Hall of Fame player. He's been his longevity in the league. And really what he's done, everywhere he's gone, he's been a leader. And, and, and the special ability that he has as not only a Spanish player, but as a player growing up as a major league player, played with a lot of great players. His development of, uh, of really, I think he's a future manager in the major league. I can say that, yeah. And, and a leader. I, the leadership that he, the tools that he has as, as a defensive player, is one of the greatest third baseman defensive players we've ever seen. And power, he, he adds power. And, 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 and he puts a lot of, uh, um, he hits for 300 too. Yeah. So he's mm-hmm. just a credible player. Adrian Bel- Beltre is my number six. All right, number five, I'm going to go with a pitcher that's still dominating currently and has really been dominating since 2012 in this postseason. It's Max Scherzer. Max Scherzer, when you look at it, he was a number three, number four guy, kind of like Bumgarner in that postseason. That postseason really got him going, and then since then he's just been one of the best regular season pitchers we've ever seen and was dominant in the postseason too this year for the Nationals in their World Series run. Phenomenal stuff, great curveball, great fastball, and again, he's been very steady, very durable for the most part. Again, he had that he had well, those those thumb issues this year, but again, really beyond that, he's been extremely durable, and he's won uh, two Cy Youngs. He's been in the conversation pretty much every year and very consistent as a whole, really from 2012 to today, and he's still one of the best pitchers in baseball today. My number five is Clayton Kershaw, uh, the dominant pitcher that he was the last, really the last 15 years, 12 years, the dominance that he is, but he has not really produced in the playoffs, and that's been his problem. And if you look him at as a player, and you have to lower this, I don't like this sound in the background. But as a player, and really as shut that off, shut the music off. I, I, I hate when you do that. When you pick music that doesn't have voices over it, and you did this last time. But it's Clayton Kershaw, really the dominance of a pitcher with the LA Dodgers, and and what he did for the Dodgers organization the last couple of years with Joe Torre uh, coming to the team, and Joe Torre said in. Imagine Joe Torre coming out and saying that he's the best pitcher he's ever coached. And you're talking about Andy Pettit, some of the great pitchers he had with the New York Yankees over the years in his championship Yankee teams like the David Wells and the Roger Clemens and all the other pitchers that he's had. He says that Clayton Kershaw is the best pitcher he's ever coached. So uh, to me, what Clayton Kershaw has done in the regular season has been absolutely remarkable. You, When you talk about Peyton Manning and comparing their careers together, both guys have been dominant in the regular season and they, they really weren't as dominant players in the playoffs as they were in the regular season. So if, if you compare him to a Peyton Manning, you can't, take, you, can't, you can't knock him off the board because it is Peyton Manning. So Clayton Kershaw is my number five. All right, number four, I'm going to take a, 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 probably the second best pitcher when you come looking at judging recently is Justin Verlander. Another guy that's been kind of up and down in the playoffs. He's been great at times, especially in 2012 when they went to the World Series. But, again, he's been up and down. I think that's really the only knock on him. But, again, beyond that, he's been very steady. He had a couple bad years in 2014 and 15, but that was really it when judging this decade. He's been rebirthed nicely since he's gone to the Astros. But, again, when he was pitching, he was a strikeout guy, fastball guy, curveball guy. He could do everything and was amazing statistically. So, Justin Verlander, number four for me. Number four is Jacob deGrom, and I'll, say, I'll tell you why Jacob deGrom. How many pitchers you know in the National League won back-to-back Cy Young uh, champion? Cy Young Awards uh, in, in the last 10 years. Not many. And Jacob DeGrom, I don't care what anybody says, well, he hasn't been dominant in the last 10 years. But the last three or four years, he's been one of the most dominant pitchers in baseball. Go look at his numbers. He had a career year a couple of years ago, 1.77 ERA. Dominant pitcher, won the Cy Young, back-to-back Cy Youngs, and he had a Cy Young with a losing record. It, mm-hmm. it, how many pitchers have you seen done do that in the last couple of years? I think the years? only other one was Zach Grinke when he was at the Royals. Um, also the guy that played for the... 
Oh, Felix Hernandez. Felix maybe, Hernandez. So, yeah, yeah, Felix okay. Hernandez, too. So I, I, he has had a remarkable career so far. And he, remember, he was drafted as a shortstop and really transitioned as a pitcher. It's a remarkable story and a remarkable career. And I think this guy has been as dominant as any pitcher in the last 10 years. So Jacob deGrom is my right, number four. Num- number three for me is a guy you mentioned earlier in Buster Posey. I think, again, when you look at him, just tremendous regular season and postseason good offensive catcher hit 300 I think he hit 331 year in his batting title year he won an MVP again until just recently very durable for the most part again great defensive catcher great with working with a lot of different pitchers and again he's had some injury issues lately but again for the most part throughout the whole decade and his postseason prowess you got to put Buster Posey up there number three Max Scherzer I mean you put him at your number five I put him at my number three he has been as dominant as any pitcher in baseball the last 10 years. You want to talk about a guy that has won a couple of Cy Youngs? This guy is has been on the top three Cy Young award winner, you know, on the top three voting for Cy Young for the last seven or eight years. He's been the most dominant player since he's gone to the Washington, uh, Washington Nationals, and he was a big part of their World Series championship last year. They brought him to win a championship. He finally won that championship. And what he's done really re- remarkable, being traded the way he was, uh, the way uh, from Arizona to Detroit mm-hmm. and really having the career that he has with Detroit and then going to the Nationals has been a remarkable career. This is guy is a first ballot Hall of Famer. Max Scherzer as my number three. All right, number two is who you just mentioned a little bit earlier is, is Clayton Kershaw. I think he's been the best, really the best pitcher of this era when you look at it. Yeah, the postseason is, is what's keeping him from being number one because he hasn't gotten done, it done in the postseason. But as we were talking about with Tracy, I mean, who says what, his legacy wouldn't have changed if the Astros didn't cheat and he finally got it over it in Game 5. Because he, he pitched well in one of those World Series games, too. Keep that in mind. I think it was Game 1 or Game 2 in L.A. So he's definitely been the best statistical pitcher. I think he was three Cy Youngs and, again, a lot of strikeouts. Probably the best curveball in terms of a generational pitch that we have in the game right now. One of the best we've ever seen, and definitely going to be a Hall of Famer when his time comes. Again, the only thing stopping him from being number one is, can he get it done in the playoffs? Justin Verlander as my number two. He's been the most dominant pitcher in my eyes in the last ten years. And I know a lot of, I have Carl saying, why, why isn't Rizzo on the list? Rizzo is still... Too early. He's still early, and, and, and to me, we're looking at the last ten years, and Rizzo hasn't been the top, uh, a top player in the league for the last ten years. So... Um, really, Justin Verlander has been the most dominant player and pitcher in, in, in the last 10 years. T- pitcher, I'm sorry, not player. But really his dominance in the American League. And in, in the American League, which dominant has been dominant from the National League for the last 10 years. Uh, the power hitting, the DH position has really tran- transitioned the game, especially in the American League. And I just think Justin Verlander winning the championship at Houston, yes, they cheated. But this is a guy that has been uh, a Cy Young candidate for the last 10 years he's been uh, amongst the league's top four, top five pitchers. So, uh, dominant pitcher, and he's gotten better as has he gotten older. So, Justin Verlander as my number two. And number one is the best player in baseball currently, Mike Trout. I mean, how could you not say Mike Trout for a guy that's been so consistent? He had one injury-riddled year in 2017, but his his pace to what he would have done in that season, even two, was amazing. He was on pace to have almost 50 home runs, I think hit 320-something in that season, too. He's just been so good everywhere, power, stolen bases, defense, fantastic. He's the best player in baseball and has been, really, for the last, I would say, six years since he came up in 2012. And Carl's arguing his point right now. He says Rizzo over Beltre. Beltre is, to me, right now, Beltre is a better player. He, he just is. Longevity and what he's done at the position. Go look at his numbers. Uh, go look at what he has done in the league as a defensive player, a- as an offensive player. Rizzo hasn't won the gold gloves that Beltre has won. Right. So it- it's a different – you can argue your points. And Jacob DeGrom, yes, you're right. Jacob DeGrom doesn't deserve it. But Jacob DeGrom has won back-to-back Cy Youngs. And there are not many uh, pitchers have done that in the last 10 years. So Jacob DeGrom's on my list because of his dominance uh, as a pitcher the last couple of years. So um, as far as I'm concerned, it's Mike Trout. Mike Trout has been the best player in baseball for the last five years. Uh, six years. He's been a, an MVP candidate practically every single year, year in and year out. The fact that he hasn't won back to back to back to back MVPs doesn't make any sense to me. He deserves it, and and really, what he is as a as a baseball player, and really, he is not the face of baseball. That's what makes him so special. Is he's not the face of baseball right now because he he plays for the Ana- Anaheim Angels and a, and a team that really doesn't get showcased enough, like the Yankees, like the Dodgers, like the Houston Astros. So. 
Uh, it's absolutely Mike Trout. He's been the best player in baseball and could go down as one of the top five, top three best baseball players if he can stay healthy uh, for the rest of his career. So it's Mike Trout. So those are our top ten baseball players of the decade. I know you guys might have your own, and you can argue your points. Yes, Rizzo's played for eight years. If you think Rizzo is in the top ten of the decade because he's played eight years, he has not been, and I'm sorry, Carl, I'm going to argue your point here. Rizzo has not been a top player at his position for the last eight years. You think he's been the top first baseman in baseball right. in the last eight years? He there's, hasn't been. There's different phases, too. You know, Joey Votto was that for a while. You got, like you were saying, Miguel Cabrera earlier. I Albert like Pujols. Rizzo. I, I like him as a player. I think Rizzo has been in that top five mold for a little bit. But I again, take Brian over him. I don't know about that because Brian sets a couple down years in a row. But in, Brian in terms, won an MVP. That is true, but I, I think in terms of judging – also, the best players of the decade, you have to take in the whole decade into account. Rizzo broke out, really, that 2014 season and started becoming one of the best at that point. And so if by you're judging the way, half and decades, by the way, maybe. Saying, and by the way, you, again, you're doing what you usually do. Uh, by the way, you're saying Rizzo helped for a 112-year drought of the Cubs. Absolutely did. So did half the players do. And, and by the way, the best and the most important player to those world, that World Series champion is... Zoberist. Mm -hmm. So go look at the numbers of what Zoberist did in the playoffs. It was absolutely remarkable. Right. And the positioning and the positions that he played uh, going all the way to the World Series. It was Zoberist. Ben Zoberist was one of the main mm -hmm. reasons why they won the World Series. Right. Rizzo was on and off that whole postseason. He wasn't really, he was awful in the first, I think, what, five games of the World Series. And then he finally broke out then. He had his phases, but he wasn't really that great player in the postseason like you saw with Baez, like you saw, like Errol was saying, with Zoberist. Uh, Kyle Hendricks from on the pitching side of it was very good. So even though he was one of the best players on the team, he wasn't one of their better postseason players. So I would, as much as I like Rizzo, I, again, Ben Zobaris was the most important player in my eyes to those world, that World Series championship Cubs team. So uh, again, you have an argument. Rizzo is a good player. He's a great player. And maybe, you know, in the next five years, you could put him in your top 10 of the mm -hmm. decade. But right now, um, I would not put him in my top you 10. You have to judge the whole decade, not just recently, the last five years or so. You're crazy if you think Rizzo has been a top 10 player of the decade. There, you know, we could have put, we could have still put, um, Mariano Rivera. We could have still put Derek Jeter. I mean, we could have put all those players. We didn't because that was at the end of their right. careers. Mm -hmm. So to say that Rizzo is there, you're crazy. I, I, I disagree. Absolutely, I would say Paul Goldschmidt over Rizzo. Oh, absolutely! In terms of what he's accomplished, absolutely. and Joe and Joey Votto. So, in terms of Dutch Degrom, the, whole the reason why we put Degrom there, I, I put Degrom there, was because of his back-to-back -back Cy Young awards. I, there are not many right. pitchers that have done that. It, first of all, who was the last pitcher to do that? Back-to-back -back Cy Youngs. Was it Tim Lincecum? I, I think it was Tim Lincecum. So. Yeah, because uh, he had those two years, and then he steamed out. Badly. It's either him or Clayton Kershaw. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So, and Carl, you asked, what did, what did DeGrom do in the postseason? I wasn't the one arguing for DeGrom. That was Errol. I, I put a kind of put DeGrom with Rizzo. He, he did it for that good half of the decade. For the six years, he's been phenomenal. But I put him there just because of what I've seen in the last couple of weeks. But again, if you want to judge what he did in the postseason, he was, he was a lot better than what Rizzo did in the postseason, even though Rizzo's team won. Go look at his ERA in the playoffs, Jacob DeGrom. Anthony Rizzo did win a ring, we know, but he wasn't the greatest player in that postseason. Mm, well, I, we're not arguing with you as far as Rizzo being a good player. I just don't think he's a top 10 player of the decade. That's all I'm going to say. Anyways, that's it for our show, ladies and gentlemen. Remember, you can listen to us every single Monday and Tuesday down to the wire and below the mic on Thursdays. I'd like to thank all the fans. I'd like to thank uh, Rob Ditoma, Ditoma for joining us. Uh, the... Uh, FDU Knights head coach and uh, the Richmond Spiders head coach, Tracy Woodson. Great interviews. Gave us great insight. Shout out to uh, Ricky and Jillian for getting them on the show. Uh, great insight of what's going on in the major leagues and college rankings. Both of them, both coaches are great. And uh, if you guys want to reach out to them, uh, you can find them on their social media. And if you guys have prospects or players that you want them to go and look at, uh, Definitely send them a, a hit on social media, and they'll look at the player. So uh, thank you for joining us, Mr. Woodson and Mr. Detoma. Anyways, uh, shout out to all our fans that listen to us. Carl 
uh, Snug, Jeff for calling the show, uh, Kenny Rayner, all the fans that listen to us and have been really big supporters of what we've been doing the last couple of days. Shout out to um, Ryan for his show, The Morning Boys This Morning. was a great show for Ryan. If you guys want to watch the replay, go on our app, guys. Download our app. Download our app. All you have to do is go on your iOS, WWSRN, and on the Android, Worldwide Sports Radio Network. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow. We have a great show lined up for you and some good intake. And by the way, Carl, if you want to call the show and argue your points about <laughs> Paul Goldschmidt or uh, Mr. Rizzo, you can do that as well. Uh, we have no problem to that. Um, again, uh, happy Memorial Day to all the fans out there. Uh, uh, drive safe. Uh, stay uh, social distancing, guys. Social distancing. Uh, don't think that the COVID-19 is going away. It's very much here, and it's not going anywhere. So stay clear. Stay safe, and we will talk to you tomorrow. Good night, everybody. You're, you're, you're listening to the Worldwide Sports Radio Network.